Hello and welcome to the balance of the week three lecture in GV4E2. As I was hurriedly concluding on Monday, we were talking about Mansur Olson and Mansur Olson's theory of collective action. He argues that collective action people cooperating to achieve some political goal, that's collective action, is often difficult because what people are usually pursuing when they act collectively are public goods. So what is a public good? A public good is something that is available to everyone in some specified group, whether or not they pay for it. And the example I used in lecture is free air. Uh, not free air, but clean air. Clean air. We all get to breathe clean air, whether or not we did anything to make sure that there was clean air in the first case. Another example might be an import tariff, say an import tariff on clothing. Every domestic clothing manufacturer benefits from an import tariff because the price of imported shirts or clothes becomes higher, and so the domestic ones are more competitive. So every domestic producer benefits. It's a public good for all those domestic producers, whether or not they did anything to get the policy passed. So a public good isn't something that necessarily is good for everyone. A public good is something that is good for everyone in some group. Now, you'll see in the title of Olson's book that there is, the subtitle is Public Goods, which we've just discussed, and the theory of groups. So what kind of groups are able to mobilize for the public goods that they want? Olson's key idea is that large groups have a very difficult time mobilizing for public goods. This is because individuals who might consider contributing to the achievement of some public good in a large, that's a like public good for a large group, will say, why should I bother? My contribution won't make very much difference. It will cost me something, and if the public good is in fact created, I'll get to benefit anyway. So why should I chip in for it? So in a large group, and essentially he's defining a large group in this way, the rationale of individuals is there's no point in contributing to attainment of the public good. He suggests, though, that other kinds of groups might be in better positions to attain the kind of public goods, public goods for their specific groups, that they want. For instance, there could be a privileged group. A privileged group is when the public good is worth so much to some individual member of the group that they will seek to provide it on their own, whether or not other people are helping them. So, for instance, suppose that I declared that the marking policy for this course is that everyone gets the mark that the best that goes to the best exam. So, no matter what your exam is like, you get the mark that the best exam got. Well, a lot of you might say, gosh, I'm not going to try at all for the exam. Somebody else will write a good exam, and I'll benefit from that. However, I hope that there's at least someone out there who would say, I really want to learn this stuff. Preparing for the exam is important to me. Getting a good mark is important to me. So I'm going to do this, whether or not anybody else helps me out or tries themselves. So you would become then, if there were such a person, a privileged group where one person was providing the public good for this group, the, the, the particular mark that the best exam attains is a public good that's accessible to everyone. And 
that person who provided it would make the group a privileged group. An intermediate group is similar except that you need a cooperation among a small number of people or actors, such as firms or whatever, to provide the public good. If you imagine that, say, in the previous example, it would take four people working together to get uh, to get a really excellent mark, maybe they would all work on preparing one person to, to do very well, that would be like an intermediate group. Okay, so that's the idea then, that smaller groups have better chances of getting the kind of public goods they want. There's one other way Olson suggests that groups might be organized, groups to attain public goods might be organized, and that's what he calls selective incentives. And the idea here is that one might be able to get a group organized to attain a public good by giving the people who contributed to the attainment of the public good some selective incentives to do so, something that was valuable to them that was not open to everyone um, else, to anyone who didn't contribute. So, for instance, it, it might be the case that if you joined a lobbying organization, you would get some benefits, say, annual membership meetings for networking or something that would not be available to people or firms that didn't join that group. So that's the idea of selective incentives. The, if you take this theory and put it all together, that small groups and groups able to deploy selective incentives are the ones that are likely to get organized, you come to the conclusion that policies that are good for everyone in this society are very hard to find political backing for, because, or policies that are good for almost everyone in a society are very hard to find political backing for, because those groups are very large and it's very hard to deploy selective incentives. So to go back to this example of the import tariff before, that tariff would benefit domestic clothing producers, but it would hurt everybody who bought clothing. But that second group is a lot larger, it's a lot harder to organize. So Olson suggests then that this logic of collective action will create a situation in which rent-seeking, which is to say the search for above competitive returns, so you make more on manufacturing clothing than you would otherwise. Rent-seeking will be pervasive and successful because it is groups that are looking for those kinds of things, for rents, that will be able to organize and get things done. So we've seen then the discussion in the preceding slide, that narrow interests will be more successful in their collective action than what Olson calls encompassing interests. Encompassing interests are interests of a large group in the sense of large group from the previous slide. Uh, this isn't necessarily a left or right position. It could be that one thinks that what this theory predicts is that the bad capitalists will always be able to organize and exploit everyone else. That would be a left-wing take on it. Um, a right-wing take might be, oh, for instance, unions will be able to organize and exploit everyone else. That's a, a position that Olson develops, for instance, in the book. Um, this theory can have anti-democratic implications because it suggests or appears to suggest that the most encompassing interests, the ones you would hope that a democracy would be defending, will never get their act together politically. So this is a right, could be a right pessimist position on democracy, which suggests that democracy will not be able to create a capitalism that works in the interest of a broad public because of the logic of collective action. So Democracy and capitalism don't go together. Now, Olson himself, as you might imagine, was a little bit unhappy with this implication that he might be read as saying that a dictator willing to act on behalf of the silent sufferers would be the preferred form of government, the one that could ensure a competitive capitalism that could defend the broad public against 
rent-seeking. It would require a politician who was simply willing to ignore what was being said by organized groups, because those organized groups wouldn't have been able to get organized in the first place if they represented anything other than narrow interests. So that was one way to read Olson, but Olson himself was not very happy with this implication, and he sought ways to talk about why democracy might be a good system and to reconcile his theory with an advocacy of democracy. And here's how he did it. He did it initially in a piece that you'll be reading for, for this coming week. He started by saying, let's imagine two kinds of bandits, two kinds of robbers. Stationary bandits and roving bandits. A roving bandit is one that moves from place to place, roves from place to place, stealing from people in each new place. The incentive of the roving bandit is to steal as much as he or she can carry and not worry about what happens to the victims of the theft, move on to the next place. However, a stationary bandit, one that steals from everybody on a particular territory, might have a different set of interests. That different set of interests would encompass longer-term interests. If I steal everything from this farmer, a stationary bandit might think, the farmer's not going to have anything for me to steal next year. I ought to, in fact, just take as much as the farmer can give but still keep growing, consistent with how much I want. In other words, the idea of a stationary bandit is that, in effect, the taxpayers are like a flock of sheep. You could, of course, sell them off for meat and wool all in one year, but it might be better to just keep shaving the wool every year. So a stationary bandit then might have encompassing interests because a stationary bandit might be interested in public order so that nobody other than the bandit, him or herself, can s steal from the taxpayers or the residents of, of the region. The stationary bandit would have an interest in economic growth over time, or at least not in e economic decline. So there might be some compatibility of interest between the stationary bandit and the broader society. There might be encompassing interests on the part of stationary bandits. Okay, having developed that analysis, Olson then turns to the idea that democracy might promote an especially good kind of stationary bandit. It's not quite the way he phrases it, but that's how the analysis slots into his theory. Any state you could think of as a stationary bandit, any coherent state could at least potentially be a stationary bandit, and a democratic state might be a particularly favorable kind of stationary bandit. And he has two... <coughs> Excuse me. Two key arguments for this. One is that a democracy is ruled by a majority, and that majority will derive some income not just from taxes, so not the majority that runs a democratic state that determines its, its policy, abstracting from all of the institutional details of democracy, of course, that majority will, of course, be able to do what it wants to do with the taxes, but it has to take into account that outside of its political role, outside of its role as in controlling policy, it also derives some income from the market, so that if the market is taxed too heavily, the result will be that the voters, the members of the majority, will not make as much income on the market as they would otherwise. So they have to consider not just how much they're going to take in taxes, but also how much they're going to earn from the market. He further argues that, so let me just say one more thing on, on that point. That means then that insofar as the Democratic majority thinks about its market income and not just its tax income, it will be more restrained in its fiscal ad 
at appetites than uh, a stationary bandit of a dicta dictatorial type might be. Furthermore, he says, Olson argues, that is to say, that one will only get a stable democracy in situations in which there's a more or less independent legal system and some kind of constitution which limits the power of rulers, because without limiting the power of rulers, you will never get any turnover of rulers and you won't have a democracy. So you don't have democracy unless you have those things. And those things happen to be just what is needed for capitalism, to have some kind of legal system and constitution limiting state power allows investment to proceed in the security that it won't be expropriated in unpredictable ways. The rules of the game will be relatively clear. It's a position similar to the position that North and Weingast take in something you'll be reading later this term. So, as a result, he thinks that democracies ought to go together with capitalism in a way that autocracy might not go together as well. Even an, an autocrat could be a stationary bandit, but a democratic stationary bandit ought to be even better. Now, I should say that one potentially troubling aspect of Olson's brief for democracy, his reconciling of democracy and capitalism, is his assumption that he knows what the right economic policy is, or that a stationary bandit would be able to implement the perfectly growth-maximizing policy, knowing what that was, that a democracy would have an even better growth-maximizing policy because it would want to have uh, less tax consumption. That, of course, rules out the sort of things you need a democracy for, right? Presumably, one needs a democracy to make decisions that might otherwise be controversial. If we know what the right decisions are, if we know what the public good is, why bother with all of this rigmarole about democracy? So there is a second kind of implicit challenge to the necessity and value of democracy in Olson's framework. The first one we were talking about before when I was talking about the ways in which we could characterize Olson as a right pessimist was the fact that open political competition might differentially empower rent seekers. The second implicit challenge to democracy is that Olson conducts his entire analysis of democracy on the assumption that there is one best economic policy. And that assumption, if true, would seem to make democracy not necessary. I thought it might be helpful to go through the analysis of stationary bandits versus democracy in Olson one more time. So, you think about a stationary bandit, the stationary bandit wants to set the tax rate such that his or her income will be maximized. And we need to think about his or her income over some period of time, but let's not get very specific about that. Well, what happens as the tax rate goes up? Initially, the stationary bandit gets more and more money, but at some point that stops. Why does that stop? Well, because as the tax rate goes up, at some point it gets to the point where it starts making the economy shrink. You know, some tax is probably going to make the economy grow because it allows the stationary band to provide public goods that help the economy to grow like security. But at some point, the tax rate gets so high that it starts to make the economy shrink or not grow as fast as it otherwise would have. So somewhere up here. Now, the stationary bandit can keep raising taxes even after they're making the economy shrink and get more money. It's just getting a shrinking share, uh, sorry, a rising share of a declining pie, right? But at some point, uh, the economy is shrinking so much that even the tax take starts to decline. There's a notion called the Laffer Curve, 
The Laffer curve means that is a the idea that at some point raising taxes actually reduces revenue. Okay, so Olson's idea then, well, we'll see that on the next slide. Olson's idea then is that the stationary bandit ought to set the tax rate at the point which maximizes his return. But democracy will actually set the tax rate lower somewhere over here. And the reason that democracy will set the tax rate lower, you see it's a lower tax rate, um, is that the voters, the majority, are thinking not just about how much are they going to be able to redistribute through taxes, but also what they'll make um, in the uh, economy. So when the economy starts shrinking, they're thinking, gosh, our businesses aren't making as, as much money, and we need to uh, not let that go too far. So maybe they're getting more, even in this zone, here, right? They're getting more from taxes to redistribute, but they're getting less from the market. And at some point in that zone, then they'll pick uh, to, to set taxes. It's also interesting to compare this to Meltzer and Richard, who have a less sanguine view of democracies in this regard than Olson does. In effect, they think that the only thing that constrains the redistributive appetites of the majority is uh, reducing the amount they have to redistribute. So essentially, they think that the democracy is just the same as a stationary bandit because they think that the issue of redistribution dominates the effect of any market returns. So you could argue about whether they think the democracy is a little bit better than a stationary bandit or not. That's not exactly the framework in which they develop things, but this gives you the basic picture, that they're less optimistic about democracies because they think that uh, redistribution will be constrained only by uh, the Laffer curve and not by a, a size of the economy curve.